Welcome to Deer Talk Now. I'm Brad Rooks. This is Brian Lovett. Today we got a great show in store. We're going to visit with Mike Matley, who works for Pratco Brands. A lot of you guys probably don't know who Pratco is, but it's it's Code Blue, uh, Night and Hail, Summit Tree Stands, and Moultrie Cameras. Mm -hmm. And we got a great deal from Mike on the Moultrie Camera. Yep, that's right. Actually, right now at Shop Deer, we have the uh, Moultrie Panoramic 150 for, I think, $200. And that's uh, Now, Brad, you've used this camera. What? Tell us a little bit about it. I haven't used it, but I got to see it. It is really cool. How it works is it's got a sensor. It's got three sensors, and basically the camera rotates. So no matter where the deer comes in, if it comes over here, it's going to sense that. The camera's going to come around. It's going to take a photo over there. If that deer continues to walk right in front of the camera and all the way out, you're going to have three different images of that deer as it comes through. What's really cool about it, what I thought was cool about it, is if this deer is on the side of you, a lot of times you never get that image. And, and you know he's not necessarily going to come in front of the camera, so he's going to branch off. You're still going to get that image. I saw the, the photos of it at the ATA show, and there's Dan. Dan's probably trying to get one free, no Dan. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Mike was telling us about the technology, and the, they had the videos right there behind us, and it is just cool. It's really cool. I'm excited to try it. $200 is a great price. Basically, yeah. it's the price of any other. Their little M80s were almost $200 last year, so this camera does it all. Right. You know, Along with that, we got a couple other great deals in there. You got the Antler King... Uh, Mega Mineral Pack, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a test little pack. Basically, anybody that buys $25 worth of products going to get this free. So you're not paying anything for it. You just got to put in the, the code right here that's on your th screen, Antler King. And, you know, it's going to be a great product. Antler King minerals are my personal favorite. If you know Todd Stittleberg, you know, he really put a lot of research. He's been in the dairy side of things. He knows what the ruminant stomach takes. They're going to eat this mineral, they absolutely devour it, they're going to get attracted to it, and it's going to help the antlers grow. So that's the other thing. Last deals you're going to hear, so I'm going to let you spill that one out. That's the Whitetail Fanatic Value Pack. Um, that's got three great products from F&W Media. Uh, first is Whitetails, A Photographic Journey Through the Seasons, which is basically just a fantastic coffee table book, uh, photography, and uh, text from longtime deer and deer hunting contributor Charlie Alzheimer. Uh, if you've seen an issue of deer and deer hunting through the past 30-some years, you've seen Charlie's fantastic photography in there. And, uh, you know, no one knows whitetail behavior better than Charlie, so this is really a great book. Um, we also have Legendary Whitetails 3, which is a book we did last year with Duncan Doby in conjunction with the Legendary Whitetail folks. And this profiles, I think, almost 40 of the greatest bucks of all time. I mean, it's got the Lovestein buck. Uh, other fantastic deer, mainly from the last 10 years, that you've probably heard about. Uh, of course, the Johnny King buck, that controversial deer. But, I mean, fantastic portrait photography, in-the-field photography, and just basically the stories of how these deer hunters came to encounter and ultimately kill these deer. It's really an interesting read. What's cool about that is so many of those bucks, you know, had never, like the Johnny King buck, Johnny had never seen that deer before. Right. I mean, other hunters in that area definitely knew it was there. They're hunting that whitetail, but Johnny was just in the right spot at the right time. I always think, you know, sooner or later after reading that book, it's going to happen to me. It's got to happen right. to me sooner yeah. or later. It gives, it gives every deer hunter hope that you Absolutely. can go out there and encounter a world-class buck this season, you know, yeah, but it really is cool. That's the, the human side of the book is really what makes it neat. You know, I think about the Hattie Peck buck from Iowa. You know, this was a deer they had seen quite a bit, but they could never kill it. And finally, it was on a drive. They actually encountered it and had I mean, just an incredible hunt, you know, to finally track down this deer and get it. But, uh, yeah, so that book's also available. Fantastic read. And also, uh, season seven of Deer and Deer Hunting TV. Uh, of course, some great footage, great destinations in there as well, some fantastic hunts. Yeah, everybody's kind of familiar with Deer and Deer Hunting TV. It is, if you're not, it's just like the magazine. It's hardcore. We pick a subject matter, really rip that thing, get into that, that subject matter, and tell you how, by understanding this information, it's going to make you a better deer hunter. Yeah, and fantastic. So I think what we'll do now is maybe give uh, Mr. Mike Matley a call and talk to him about uh, some things that are going on in his neck of the woods. Uh, folks don't know, Mike lives in uh, southern Iowa near the Centerville area. I mean, it's uh, Big Buck Central. You probably saw in the last issue of Deer and Deer Hunting. Uh, it's actually an issue that's just going to be coming out here, actually. Uh, Mike's son, Nick, killed a fantastic whitetail this past season. The 197, was it, Brad? Something yeah, like that? It's actually going to be on the cover of the next issue. Yes. Oh, of course, I know. Hello, this is Mike. 
Hey, Mike, this is Brad and Brian. You're talking on Deer Talk Now. Awesome. How are you guys doing? Good. How are you? Good. Doing great today. Is it spring down there yet? Or? It, it's starting to get that way. Most of the snow melted um, this weekend, uh, and, and uh, so it's kind of muddy, but that's spring in Iowa. <laughs> so i got to ask, have you guys been out shed antler hunting so far? We have, and it's it, we went out um, two days, and we've, we've had some <laughs> really good luck, actually. So we found 94 so far. Oh, my oh. goodness. Wow. What's, uh, what's the biggest side you've found so far, Mike? Well, we, we have, uh, gosh, I think it was about 70 inches. Between 65 and 70 inches, so nothing huge, but, you know, a deer that, being the 150s. Yeah, not big, you know, just a, just a run-of-the-mill 150. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it always seems to be that those giant ones end up in a farmer's tire someplace out in the middle of nowhere that you, you'd never think to look. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where are you finding most of them, Mike? Um, actually, right around food sources. Excellent. Um, no. And and that's what's really strange this year because we've we've went and uh, you know with the drought that we had a lot of the food plots just didn't make it. Um, so anything that anywhere that there was food, the deer converged on it heavily and just wiped it out. Um, one of the nice things, and and I don't know if um, if you guys have have had it up in your neck of the woods, but the government did this cover crop program this year. And in that program, they, they're subsidizing farmers to go through and, and plant cover crops as soon as they harvest their, their fields. Um, it's typically focused for, you know, for erosion, but uh, the farmers really get into it when, on years that there's a drought and because then they typically get the crops out sooner so they can get a double crop in to try to, um, you know, make their money back off of the, off the poor harvest from the initial crop. So a lot of the, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the guys down here have went and planted winter wheat or, um, you know, oats, rye, uh, and then there's a new, uh, a fairly new crop that I, I wasn't familiar with, a lot of guys down here weren't, it's called triticale. And it's kind of a hybrid ryegrass from what I understand, and the deer absolutely love it. Uh, ended up that the, the farmer that rents out my ground, he went and planted, um, after he chopped all the corn in September because it wasn't worth harvest, it wasn't worth combining, uh, chopped it for silage then planted 55 acres of triticale and it got about eight inches tall before the in the first hard freeze and there would be between 40 and 100 deer every night out in that field mm -hmm. I and mean, they came from everywhere to eat it and that's more of a grass type isn't that more like it a, is yeah. it is it's a grass type they they drill it in it to me, I, I don't know enough about it, but to me, when I look at it, it looks just like winter wheat out there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually use that in a little bit of my blend. I, I blend winter wheat, uh, winter oats, and triticale. I call it triticale. I don't know if it's Right, I, and I don't know how to pronounce it. I've heard triticale, triticale. I, <laughs> so, um, but I have heard that there, are, that there are a few food plot companies out there that have mixed it in a little bit with some of their blends. Yes. And, uh, um, but then they'll come back through this spring, and like in May, they'll come through and they'll, they'll mow it and bale it, and it has a really high protein content um, and has a, lot, a real high t tonnage, usually. It'll yield, yield very high tonnage, <clears throat> something similar to alfalfa wow. and hmm. and the nice thing about it is that you can burn it down with roundup a lot easier it'll kill off a lot easier than winter wheat will so that they can come right behind after after they mow it and bale it burn it down and then plant beans in the end of may first part of june now has hmm. that stuff already started greening up down there or not oh yeah yeah it actually it never stopped greening up so it's just like winter wheat well huh? yeah yeah, it did. Now the rye grass, a lot of the rye grasses, they it they didn't stay green. They were supposed to, um, but they didn't. I don't know. 
if it was just the moisture or you know the temperatures how we had or or what but the triticale it, it stayed it stayed green so did the winter wheat um and i had a really good winter re- winter wheat patch a six acre patch of it that i planted in august but i actually the deer would leave it to go eat the triticale really wow that's yeah. impressive mm-hmm and I don't know if it's because it was six acres versus 55 acres or what, but they were right next to each other. You, you know, so that, that told me that they had to like it better. I, I'm one of those guys, too, that believes if it's different. You know, if you're in a, in a region of the country and everybody else has winter wheat and you have triticale or triticale, whichever one it is, they're going to gravitate towards that food source that, that's not found everywhere. Mm-hmm. So. It's you know that makes perfect sense, and I and I've read a lot and read in in you guys' magazine about about how deer like the buffet. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of deer that die with a belly full of corn, um, but they don't have anything else to eat other than a pile of corn. They they can't survive, so they they like that buffet. And I watched one one year I went out, and it was winter time after season. And there was alfalfa, beans, and corn that I had planted on my property. And, and I thought, okay, I'm going to figure this out once and for all. And I waited there for two or three hours and watched deer. And they would jump the fence and go from one to the other, back and forth, back and forth. And I could not tell that they spent any more time in one food source over, over the other. And uh, talking with biologists, uh, the right for you guys, like Matt Harper, he said they, they have to have a variety of food. Yeah. And uh, uh, they like that buffet. So if you don't have enough, if you if you have a variety, you can keep the deer on your property longer. You, you know, I played around just like you said and, and overlooked three food sources. And what really boggled my mind is one night, you know, they'll go into all three. But one night it seems like they're really into the beans. And as a hunter, you're like, all right, tomorrow night I'm going to go to the beans. Yeah. And tomorrow <laughs> night they're in the corn. It's like, how right. can this be? You know, it's the same weather front, same conditions, and the next night they're all gravitated towards the corn. Yeah, some deer came into the beans, but I just there's no rhyme or reason to it. You're exactly right. And I don't know, again, I don't know um, why it is from one night to the other, but but you're exactly right. I've seen the same thing. You, you set all up and you're thinking, okay, it's cold enough. They need the fat content and the protein content. They don't need the carbs. Going to set up on the beans. And then all of a sudden, boom, they're across the fence over on the corn. Yep. So you move to the corn, then they move to the beans. And like, <laughs> so um, just seeing them walk back and forth, and I, I've just, I guess, uh, um, given into the the ideology that you, as long as you, you need to have multiple foods there to keep them on your property. Right, I agree. Hey, we got a picture of you up right now with that panoramic 150. Tell us in your words what advantages this trail camera has over anything else on the market. Well, it's the first camera that has um, has a, a movable lens and the LEDs. Okay, so you have your your flash. The low glow flash is attached to the silent slide lens. So that's the one cool thing about it. Then there is three different PIR sensors. So you have the passive infrared sensors that will detect, you know, when you have a detection from a change of temperature, movement with temperature. So the, um, so when you have an animal walk by, it'll have a detection. So what happens, you have basically two different modes. You have single mode or panoramic mode. On single mode, it works as a trail camera. It goes through whichever one of the three PIR sensors has a detection. The lens moves to that quadrant, that third, takes the image, and returns back to the center, ready to go. So a normal trail camera has about a 50-degree field of view. Okay, that's what the area that it's covering. This one will allow you to cover 150 degrees. So it's like you have three cameras stacked up at an angle next to each other, okay. which works really good if you're on an intersecting path area, um, you know, where trailheads come together, a corner post on a field, something like that. In the panoramic mode, you switch it over to panoramic mode. Then what happens is all three PIRs are are working. When any of the three has a detection, it'll take an image on the right, then in the center, 
then on the left, and then it ties those three together to to make a true panoramic picture that's, that covers a 150-degree field of view. Mm. So, so when you're looking at a food plot, that will give you 150 degrees field of view. The flash will reach out to 100 feet. So, I mean, essentially, we're... For instance, if you if you have it on a feeder, your camera picture is going to be focused 50 degrees on this feeder. If a deer is off to the side 20 feet, you'll never get it with a normal camera. You'll never pick it up. But in this panoramic, you'll pick it up on both sides. Hmm. So with the, I mean, a buck's walking through a trail crossing or through a large food plot. I mean, you're literally going to get uh, many more images of this deer and be able to assess that deer uh, much more thoroughly than with a standard trail camera, right? Exactly. And, uh, you know, on a food plot, you can have a picture come up that a deer, you know, we've, we've all, the arguments out there that, you know, some deer will get trail camera shy, you know, camera shy, and they'll stay away from them, blah, blah, blah. Right, wrong, or indifferent. If that is the case, if you do get a deer that just, stays away from your cameras for whatever reason, and he stays out there 50 yards to the right, you're going to still get him because he's going to be in that quadrant that's way out there. Yeah. So you can essentially, you can set this up and cover an entire football field-sized food plot hmm. from one position. Which is amazing for one camera to be able to do that. And, and you, know, you run cameras, Mike, as hard as I do in the past. I cannot tell you how many times I got a picture of a doe or something, and behind that, here's a giant. You know, yeah. it never got that giant. It just took a picture of the doe, and the giant happened to be in the photo. And you're going to have a lot more opportunities with this camera to get that kind of image than what you had in the past. Exactly, and that and that is that's that is what we have found. That all of a sudden, and I've been testing one of these uh, behind my house in Iowa um, this this late season. And it's working below. I have pictures where the camera lens, the silent side lens, and everything is working 100% down to six below zero. Wow. <laughs> that's impressive. Wow. So that's, that's one of the things other that, you know, for the upper Midwest, and a lot of guys will say, well, you know, I don't, it, hunting season, it never gets that cold, what have you. But I use cameras pretty much year round now. Um, I use them to help figure out when to start shed hunting. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as season's over, most states will allow you to bait. If if you can't bait d during season, you can feed the deer uh, after season is over. So I'll go out there and I'll put out some corn, put out a feeder, and get the deer coming to a location, and then set up a camera on it. And as soon as I get to the point, you know, check the camera every two weeks, get to the point that... There's a whole, they're, they're, most of the bucks have dropped their antlers, then it's time to go shed hunting. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I, I use it in that, that aspect of it over, over a food plot, over a feeder, um, to tell you when, when to go out there. Because when we go look, my son and all his buddies, we'll get a whole, whole army of, of kids out there, and it's like a, a junior high Easter egg hunt. <laughs> they just love it, and and you know you go out there with ten people on four wheelers and and um, going through the sweep of the property, cross sectioning everything, trying not to miss any. If you do that and the deer are still have antlers on their head, they're gone. They're not going to tolerate that. So we want to make sure that we use cameras to make sure that the vast majority have dropped their antlers before we go out there and and run them off. Yeah, it makes sense to me. I do yeah. the same exact thing. What, what, what's some other camera tips here? I'm talking when it gets in the summer, you know, give us some more advice of running trail cameras on your property. <clears throat> you know, the, the, one of the biggest things um, that, that I have seen are, are mineral sites, you know, for helping the deer, especially um, with their physiological needs on, on good minerals. If uh, where where it's legal, you can go out there and put it, put good minerals out there on multiple sites and uh, and start seeing the bucks as they're growing. See the does as they're bringing their fawns into the mineral sites and and you can 
you have a, a much better idea of what is living right there. Um, you know, you can see one of the things that I, I have noticed um, on my properties is that the bucks will have, where they get into their, right now they're back in bachelor groups. The, the ones that have made it through season are back in bachelor groups and they're hanging out together again. And, you know, they're already starting to go to um, mineral sites and uh, getting back into that the normal swing of things. And they'll stay in that group. So now you can see, okay, as spring comes and summer, you have these bachelor groups. What deer have made it? What, what mature deer have made it and have called your property home? And so you can kind of start planning um, early on. You know, July, you can start planning. You have a pretty good idea of what's going to be on your property um, to go hunting early season by July, you know, around the 4th of July. Uh, granted, the deer, you're going to finish out differently, but, but you, have a, you have a really good idea what, what is going to be there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's one of the nice things about it. Um, also, the, using the, the cameras year-round, it lets me, like we were talking earlier, try to figure out which paths the deer are using for late season, okay, so the deer are usually coming in and out of these. You can see in the snow. You can typically tell if it's a buck track or a doe track. So that lets you know where your stand placement, if you need to move your stands, okay, hey, well, we had a lot of late season traffic over here in this corner of the food plot, and um, they were predominantly buck tracks were on this trail. So make a mental note. That's where I'm going to plant, uh, put up my tree stand for next fall, early bow season, because what I have seen is they 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 move into the area, they stay there after after when they they're dropping their antlers, they get back in their bachelor groups, and they'll stay kind of in that same pattern all the way up until they get into the point in the fall where they start fighting for dominance and territory again, and then they disperse out of their bachelor groups. You know, so if you want to do some early season hunting you can key in on where they were late season. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mike, what else do you do in terms of your uh, spring scouting? Are you actually starting observations of fields uh, in late May and June as the antler growth continues, or do you actually get out and walk your property now and then, look for rub lines, things like that? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I try to, in the past I didn't, and I think I have I've made it more difficult because it's like, oh crap, you know, I missed this. Now I have to go through and completely re, um, I have to change up everything. Where if you're out there on a regular basis, I think the deer tolerate your existence, your coexistence with them a lot better, as opposed to showing up opening day. Um, I think, I, I honestly believe that that's why you see the farmers can drive their tractor right up by the deer and they don't, they don't booger or run off. But we go out there in a four wheeler, and and they don't tolerate that so well. Uh, I, so I think it's something that it's a conditioned response that they're just used to. So if you're going out there on a regular basis, checking your cameras year round, they get used to it. But if you don't put your cameras out until September 1st, and you're going out there every day, they they don't like that at all. Um, so I'm trying to do more of that, more getting out. Uh, seeing what their paths are, seeing if they've made any changes due to, you know, what what row crops have been planted, um, because they, they do, as as we all know, they different types of the year they need or desire different types of food um, from when the the hay is coming up and it's soft and and lush versus when it stems out, you know, uh, how they like the alfalfa for the clover fields versus when the corn is growing and, and before when it's silking out, how they like that. Uh, the, the bean fields, the beans are green, and they're eating the leaves on the, on the beans versus when they turn yellow and they get bitter to the taste. So trying to be cognizant of that throughout the, the year and see what the deer are doing as opposed to doing a crash course in September, I think is it makes your life just a, a lot easier. I 100% agree. I mean, there's so many people that don't even put their crow cameras out until the middle of July, the end of July, first part of August. 
And, yeah. and you're just educating those deer. Hey, uh, hunting season's coming. You yeah. better start it getting out there. You know, <laughs> uh, uh, I run my cameras year round just like you do. I, I really don't do it hard like during turkey season. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, we get really active when we're planting in the food plots. So from the end of April, mid May, you know, we're constantly checking them because I'm trying to educate those deer literally that we're not, there's no fear here. They're just working on food plots. You know, yeah, we check right. the trail cameras. For those guys, yeah. Mike, I know you guys have a camera for those guys that fear about going into a particular spot as well. You get an alternative for them, don't you? We do. We, we still have um, some of the cellular cameras uh, on that use the Moultrie game management system. And essentially what that allows you to do is use uh, AT&T service with, an, with a cellular modem, and it can upload your images to a website and essentially you can go and put it up and and check everything remotely from your desktop yeah it's cool and for those guys that want to and, and if they really want low impact uh scouting that is a key to it um but what we really made it for was for the the non-resident landowners or the guys that lease ground out of state i mean we're looking at gas at four bucks a gallon right now if you have to drive from your place to my place, it's eight hour drive. I mean, you gotta take a loan out at the bank to, to come down for the weekend. <laughs> and that's it's just ridiculous where you can go through we have a pay as you go modem on it, so it works kinda like a um a track phone per se. You don't have a a contract on it. You can put fifty bucks on there. It's so so many dollar for image or so many cents per image as it goes through and you upload the stuff and um you know you want to do it for a month you want to do it for a month and a half you, you know you can if if you say i've got 250 bucks you can do the 250 bucks and stop mm -hmm. um so it's not something that you have to be on the hook for the entire year so those uh those work work really well um for those non non resident landowners or leasees, uh, if even if you have for you guys, you know, up up north you guys have a lot of uh hunt camps where the hunt camp may be maybe three two, three hours away and kind of by what we have figured if you throw out your time and say your time is worthless, which our time is worth more than more than anything, uh you just start looking at the cost of gas uh, wear and tear in your vehicles, that type of thing, once you get past two hours, it pays for itself. Wow. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mike, kind of a two-pronged question here. Um, first off, did you see any evidence of blue tongue in your area this past summer? And uh, along with that, how do you think your deer in southern Iowa came through winter? We, uh, yes, we did have, we did have the blue tongue come through. Um, it did not hit our county very bad, uh, and I say that while we have a lot of deer in, in, in certain locations in the, in the counties right around where I live, we have a high deer density, um, but it's, it's, we're, we have a lot of clean farming practices going on, so one, one section may not have a single deer in it, and the next section may have 200 in it because they've gotten pushed out, there are no ditches, fence rows, and a lot of the, because of a lot of the clean farming practices. With that, I have found, we, when we were shed hunting, we found uh, three, three dead bucks in velvet. Um, on my 280 acres, I found 11 this year um, that were, that we believe died due to blue tongue, EHD, which, whichever the case. Um, they were all around ponds or creeks. They, the bucks that were in velvet, you know, I had to assume that they were. All the rest of them were does and fawns that I found right along, right at the edge of the ponds. Wow. Hmm. And I found those in, you know, my neighbor's game warden, and he called and asked if I'd seen any, so I hopped on the four-wheeler and just drove around three of my ponds and found five the first day. And... uh so 11 out of 280 acres in most scenarios that's a lot um but like i said we have we have high a lot higher deer densities 
so 11 was kind of a drop in the bucket. Now, there was other counties down here that got hit really hard um, up by Winterset, Iowa, southwest of Des Moines. Uh, they had hundreds upon hundreds that they found up there. Mm. And um, it, it really hurt their deer hunting up there. What age structure were you finding in the bucks? Was it all of them, or was it the older bucks? Or The bucks that we found were, were young. They were, we, I found one spike, so about a year and a half old, and then the other two were eight points that would have been, one would have, they both would have been two and a half year old deer. Wow. Now, I did talk with several guys that hunted out around the lake on public hunting, and they found, the one group found five bucks over 150. Oof, oof. Those hurt. When they were doing drives, and they were said they all had velvet on them, and they were dead along the pond, uh, along the lake edge. So they assumed, again, that it, that that's what it, it was. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I'll so give it, you... it, it, didn't, it didn't seem to discriminate this time. It kind of hit all ages of them, I believe. Just, now, just... as far as winter goes, we didn't have a hard winter. Uh, we had very little snow this year. We had very... Very few days below zero, um, which is all helpful because we had so little food sources going through. Now, I I do believe I have other than a gut feeling that um, that we our deer numbers will be hurt because there was so little food. I think that there I think there's going to be a lot of single fawns this year as opposed to twins and triplets like we we have a, normally. Just because there was somewhere around 25 percent of our of our corn in this county was chopped for silage, so that leaves very little remnants in the field for the deer to eat. Um, the the farmers that did go back and plant cover crop, you know, the deer just came in mass to those areas, but. Not all the farmers did that. You know, again, it was probably 20% of them came back in and planted cover crop because they have to have all, a lot of the row crop farmers don't do uh, hay crops anymore. So you have to have all the, the hay cutting and baling equipment to, to take care of these cover crops. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. You know, we, we're we not faring quite as well. We had a really no. cold winter and a lot of snow. <laughs> a lot of snow. Um, actually, wow. I think last week I was on the show said there's one deer, you know, died, definitely starved to death in the neighbor's yard. And right after the show, I drove by that same neighbor's house, and now there's two dead ones laying yeah. in his yard. Well, what makes it tough, too, is now we're in mid-March, and our winter's really hanging on now. I mean, this is kind of that critical time when it really can affect wildlife, can it, Brad? Yeah, absolutely. It's vital. The other thing is... You know, unfortunately, we got some of that rain, and then now it froze. It might got cold again, yeah. so now you got a big layer of ice. Two things: it's bad on the deer; they can't get into the food. And clover, for whatever reason, you put a layer of ice on clover for a month, and you got some serious trouble. I mean, yeah. it's gonna, yeah. it's going to die. It dies out. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why that is, but it does. So I'm not looking forward to seeing my clover. You know, yeah, the clover field, a lot of the food plots, like I said, down here, we did a lot of fall planting on trying to get some clovers in that in because they we planted them in the spring and they died, so we tried them in the fall. thought, well, gosh, the rain's got to come sooner or later, and again, it got, they got killed off. And But you were right, clover does not tolerate ice. It, I, I don't know why, but it, it does not tolerate it at all. And so a lot of my food plots this year I'll have to be completely redoing, um, so that uh, ha have some have some good good food coming into for the summer and next fall. Um, but like you were saying, they get that ice on, and not only does it hurt the deer, but I mean the turkeys just get oh, mm -hmm. annihilated. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's and a fact. And that season's right around the corner. Yeah. Mike, I'm going to give you one more chance to plug one more product that all your bland, brands, we talked a lot about the Practico side. What's one of the other cool products from one of the other brands? Well, as far as uh, uh, on the deer hunting side of it, one of the really cool things for for this, this coming, I guess, turkey, um, it's right around the corner, we've got some of the new turkey calls. And uh, the Long Spur series is a, is a new pot call. It's a polycarbonate pot, 
basically it's a, it's a type of a plastic, uh, so it's lightweight, and our engineers are played around with it to come up with these rings and holes through the bottom of the pot that um, how they're positioned, where they're positioned, just gives it a richer, livelier tone um, with all the, all the different pitches. So the sound quality is really, really good with it. We made another process change on how we made that. A lot of the pot calls, is, as Brian knows, a lot of them are, are use spin welding process um, to secure the, the friction surface to the pot. Well, we went to a pressure glued process. So with this machine, we can accurately put out the exact amount of glue on each surface and, and how that is applied to the pot so that they're, each call is consistent. Um, so you can pull one after the other after the other out of, the, out of a package and they're going to have that same sound. Nice. Yeah, and I've uh, I heard uh, Chris Parrish run a prototype of that long spur last year, and it's uh, trust me, it it sounds good. <laughs> so, uh, and we're gonna get a chance to see some of those at the uh, Turkey and Turkey Hunting Dream Camp down there in uh, North Missouri this year too, Mike. So. Yeah, that sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I am too, big time. Hard to imagine right now when it's snowing outside today and it's 20 degrees or whatever, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> One of these days, we'll hear a turkey gobble. I know. Every day when I drive by the big flocks and I see like 20 gobblers together, I'm like, boy, <laughs> just please. Right now, they're all on my land. I'm just like, please, just stay right stay where together, you are. Stay together. <laughs> the youth season is going to be a lot of fun on the old Rooks farm is all I have to say. Good deal. Uh, yeah, you got to be a 12 or 16-year-old or I'd have you down, Mike. So yeah. Okay. All right. Well. Hey, I want to thank you for your time, Mike. Uh, oh, thank you, guys. Yeah, absolutely. And just so you know, since Dan couldn't join us today, you have to decide who you're taking deer hunting this year. It's either me or Brian. doesn't matter. But just let Schmidt by email know that he is not included in this year's yep, hunt. Yeah, okay? exactly. <laughs> We're in agreement on this. That All right. sounds good. All right. Take care. Thanks, Bye -bye. Mike. All right, Mike. You know, that camera that they got is just cool. And, and it's available in the store. I mean, right now you can go to shopdeerhunting.com. You can get it. It's around $200 is what Brian looked it up. So don't quote me on the price. But it is the coolest thing out there that I saw for new technology yeah. and trail cameras. Well, it just seems like it increases your options so much. I mean, him talking about it, you're literally increasing your efficiency, you know, 66%. Uh, you know, I mean, you're, like you talked about, you get an image of a doe and the buckets in the background. That was your one shot at that deer, perhaps. Now you have, you know... Uh, three times as many shots at that deer. And, you know, not only that, but if you get good images, be able to assess that deer all the better before hunting season opens. Absolutely. So. Every time you see a deer at a different angle, it, it gives you a new perspective on how big that rack is. Because yeah. uh, I'll be honest with you, I've been fooled several times where you think you had a 140-inch deer, turns into 160, and I thought I had a 160, it turned into 130. You know what I mean? <laughs> it, it, it's all the perspective on what that deer looks like, and sometimes at night, the flash or the black LEDs blow up. Looks like it has a lot more mass. You see it during the daylight. So this is going to give you a lot more options. A couple other deals I just want to go over it again is that Mega Mineral uh, value pack from Antler King. It's a test of different minerals. Anytime you order $25 or more of product, you're going to get this free. Just enter that Antler King code into the when you're checking out, and you're going to get it. It's a great value. As I said before, Antler King has good products. The last one is that Whitetail Value Pack. Whitetail Fanatic Value Pack, yep. Legendary Whitetail 3, 40 of the greatest bucks of all time. Charlie Alzheimer's Whitetails, a photographic journey through the seasons. Just an incredible uh, coffee table picture book. And Season 7 of Deer and Deer Hunting TV featuring Brad and Dan and all the other folks here at Deer and Deer Hunting. So. Not so much Brad. Brad didn't have a good year. That year <laughs> killing much. So it's more of the Dan, Dan Schmidt killing show. Is okay, what it is. all right. Well, that's all right, too. Anyway, I'm Brad Rooks. This is Brian Lovett. We're going to sign off. Till next week, we'll see you Wednesday.